This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain, and for more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristin Luoma, GreenKRI.com Of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 1 Marseille, the Arrival On the 24th of February, 1815, the lookout at Notre-Dame de la Garde signalled the three-master, the Pharaon, from Smyrna, Trieste, and Naples. As usual, a pilot put off immediately, and routing the Chateau d'If, got on board the vessel between Cape Morgent and Rion Island. Immediately, and according to custom, the ramparts of Fort Saint-Jean were covered with spectators. It is always an event at Marseille for a ship to come into port, especially when this ship, like the Ferron, has been built, rigged, and laden in the old Fossi docks, and belongs to an owner of the city. The ship de Rouen, and had safely passed the strait, which some volcanic shock has made between the Calasren and Jaros Islands, had doubled Pomeg, and approached the harbour under topsails, jib, and spanker, but so slowly and sedately that the idlers, with that instinct which is the forerunner of evil, asked one another what misfortune could have happened on board. However, those experienced in navigation saw plainly if any accident had occurred, it was not to the vessel herself, for she bore down with all the evidence of being skilfully handled, the anchor a cock-bill, the jib-boom guys already eased off, and standing by the side of the pilot, who was steering the pharaon towards the narrow entrance of the inner port, was a young man who with activity and vigilant eye watched every motion of the ship and repeated every direction of the pilot. The vague disquietude which prevailed among the spectators had so much affected one of the crowd that he did not await the arrival of the vessel in harbour, but jumping into a small skiff desired to be pulled alongside the Ferron, which he reached as she rounded into La Reserve Basin. When the young man on board saw this person approach, he left his station by the pilot, and hat in hand, leaned over the ship's bulwarks. He was a fine, tall, slim young fellow of eighteen or twenty, with black eyes and hair as dark as a raven's wing, and his whole appearance bespoke that calmness and resolution peculiar to men accustomed from their cradle to contend with danger. "'Ah, is it you, Dantes?' cried the man in the skiff. "'What's the matter, and why have you such an air of sadness aboard?' "'A great misfortune, Monsieur Morel,' replied the young man. "'A great misfortune, for me especially. "'Of Civita Vecchia we lost our brave Captain Leclerc.' "'And the cargo?' inquired the owner, eagerly. "'Is all safe, Monsieur Morel, and I think you will be satisfied on that head. "'But poor Captain Leclerc!' "'What happened to him?' asked the owner, with an air of considerable resignation. "'What happened to the worthy captain?' "'He died. "'Fell into the sea?' "'No, sir. He died of brain fever in dreadful agony. "'Then, turning to the crew, he said, "'Bear a hand there, to take in sail.' "'All hands obeyed, and at once the eight or ten seamen who composed the crew "'sprang to their respective stations at the spanker brails, and out haul topsail sheets and halyards, the jib down haul, and the topsail clue lines and bunt lines. The young sailor gave a look to see that his orders were promptly and accurately obeyed, and then turned again to the owner. And how did this misfortune occur? inquired the latter, resuming the interrupted conversation. Alas, sir, in the most unexpected manner. After a long talk with the harbour master, Captain Leclerc left Naples greatly disturbed in mind. In twenty-four hours he was attacked by a fever, and died three days afterwards. We performed the usual burial service, and he is at his rest, sewn up in his hammock with a thirty-six-pound shot at his head and his heels off El Giglio Island. We bring to his widow his sword and cross of honour. It was worth while, truly, added the young man with a melancholy smile, to make war against the English for ten years, and to die in his bed at last, like everybody else. "'Why, you see, Edmund,' 
replied the owner, who appeared more comforted at every moment. We are all mortal, and the old must wait way for the young. If not, there would be no promotion, and since you assure me that the cargo— is all safe and sound, Monsieur Morel, take my word for it, and I advise you not to take twenty-five thousand francs for the profits of the voyage. Then, as they were just passing the round tower, the young men shouted, Stand there to lower the topsails and jib! Brail up the spanker! The order was executed as promptly as it would have been on board a man of war. Let go! And clue up! At this last command all the sails were lowered, and the vessel moved almost imperceptibly onwards. "'Now, if you will come on board, Monsieur Morel, said Dantès, observing the owner's impatience, "'here is your supercargo, Monsieur Danglars, coming out of his cabin, who will furnish you with every particular. As for me, I must go look after the anchoring and dress the ship in mourning.' The owner did not wait for a second invitation. He seized a rope which Dantès flung to him and with an activity that would have done credit to a sailor, climbed up the side of the ship, while the young man, going to his task, left the conversation to Danglars, who now came towards the owner. He was a man of twenty-five or twenty-six years of age, of unprepossessing countenance, obsequious to his superiors, insolent to his subordinates, and this, in addition to his position as responsible agent on board, which is always obnoxious to the sailors, made him as much disliked by the crew as Edmond Dantès was beloved by them. "'Well, Monsieur Morel,' said Danglars, "'you have heard of the misfortune that has befallen us.' "'Yes, yes, poor Captain Leclerc. He was a brave and honest man. A first-rate seaman, one who had seen long and honourable service, has become a man charged with the interests of a house so important as that of Morel and son,' replied Danglars replied the owner, glancing after Dantès, who was watching the anchoring of his vessel. It seems to me that a sailor needs not be so old as you say, Danglars, to understand his business, for our friend Edmund seems to understand it thoroughly and not to require instruction from any one. Yes, said Danglars, darting at Edmund a look gleaming with hate. Yes, he is young, and youth is invariably self-confident. Scarcely was the captain's breath out of his body when he assumed the command without consulting any one, and he caused us to lose a day and a half at the island of Elba, instead of making for Marseilles direct. "'As to taking command of the vessel,' replied Morel, "'that was his duty as captain's mate. As to losing a day and a half off the island of Elba, he was wrong unless the vessel needed repairs.' "'The vessel was in as good condition as I am, and—' as I hope you are, Monsieur Morel, and this day and a half was lost from pure whim for the pleasure of going ashore and nothing else. Dantes, said the shipowner, turning towards the young man, come this way. In a moment, sir, answered Dantes, and I'm with you. Then calling to the crew, he said, let go. The anchor was instantly dropped, and the chain rattling through the porthole. Dantes continued at his post in spite of the presence of the pilot, until this manoeuvre was completed, and then he added, "'Half-mast the colours and square the yards!' "'You see,' said Danglars, "'he fancies himself captain already, upon my word.' "'And so, in fact, he is,' said the owner. "'Except your signature and your partner's, Monsieur Morel.' "'And why should he not have this?' asked the owner. "'He is young, it is true, but he seems to me a thorough seaman, and a full experience.' A cloud passed over Danglars' brow. "'Your pardon, Monsieur Morel,' said Dantès, approaching. "'The vessel now rides at anchor, and I am at your service. You held me, I think?' Danglars retreated a step or two. "'I wish to inquire why you stopped at the island of Elba.' "'I do not know, sir.' It was to fulfill the last instructions of Captain Leclerc, who, when dying, gave me a packet for Marshal Bertrand. Then did you see him, Edmund? Who? The Marshal. Oh, yes. Morel looked around him, and then, drawing Dantès on one side, he said suddenly, And how is the Emperor? Very well, as far as I could judge from the sight of him. You saw the Emperor, then? He entered the marshal's apartment while I was there. And you spoke to him? 
"'Why, it was he who spoke to me, sir,' said Dantes, with a smile. "'And what did he say to you?' "'Asked me questions about the vessel, the time she left Marseilles, the course she had taken, and what was her cargo. I believe if she had not been laden, and I had been her master, he would have bought her. But I told him I was only mate, and that she belonged to the firm of Morel and son. "'Ah, yes,' he said, "'I know them. The Morels have been shipowners from father to son. And there was a Morel who served in the same regiment with me when I was in garrison at Balance. "'Pardieu, and that is true,' cried the owner, greatly delighted. "'And that was Polakar Morel, my uncle, who was afterwards a captain. "'Dantes, you must tell my uncle that the emperor remembered him, "'and you will see, it will bring tears into the old soldier's eyes. "'Come, come,' continued he, patting Edmund's shoulder kindly. "'You did very right, Dantes, to follow Captain Leclerc's instructions, "'and touch at Elba, although if it were known that you had conveyed a packet to the marshal, "'and had conversed with the emperor, it might bring you into trouble.' "'How could that bring me into trouble, sir?' asked Dantes, for I did not even know of what I was the bearer, and the emperor merely made such inquiries as he would of the first comer. But pardon me, here are the health officers and the customs inspectors come alongside. And the young man went to the gangway. As he departed, Danglars approached and said, Well, it appears that he has given you satisfactory reasons for his landing at Porto Ferrajo. Yes, most satisfactory, my dear Danglars. "'Well, so much the better,' said the supercargo, "'for it is not pleasant to think that a comrade has not done his duty.' "'Dantes has done his,' replied the owner. "'And that is not saying much. "'It was Captain Leclerc who gave orders for this delay.' "'Talking of Captain Leclerc, "'has not Dantes given you a letter from him?' "'To me? No. Was there one?' "'I believe that, besides the packet, Captain Leclerc confided a letter to his care. Of what packet are you speaking, Danglars? Why, that which Dantes left at Porto Ferrajo. How do you know he had a packet to leave at Porto Ferrajo? Danglars turned very red. I was passing close to the door of the captain's cabin, which was half open, and I saw him give the packet and letter to Dantes. He did not speak to me of it, replied the shipowner. But if there be any letter, he will give it to me. Danglars reflected for a moment. Then, Monsieur Morel, I beg of you, said he, not to say a word to Dantes on the subject. I may have been mistaken. At this moment the young man returned. Danglars withdrew. Well, my dear Dantes, are you now free? inquired the owner. Yes, sir. You have not been long detained. No, I gave the custom-house officers a copy of our bill of lading, and as to the other papers, they sent a man off with the pilot, to whom I gave them. Then you have nothing more to do here? No, everything is all right now. Then you can come and dine with me? I, I really must ask you to excuse me, Monsieur Morel. My first visit is due to my father, though I am not the less grateful for the honour you have done me. "'Right, Dantes, quite right. I always knew you were a good son.' "'And,' inquired Dantes, with some hesitation, "'do you know how my father is?' "'Well, I believe, my dear Edmund, though I have not seen him lately.' "'Yes, he likes to keep himself shut up in his little room. "'That proves, at least, that he has wanted for nothing during your absence.' "'Dantes smiled.' My father is proud, sir, and if he had not a meal left, I doubt he would have asked anything from any one except from heaven. Well, then, after this first visit has been made, we shall count on you. I must again excuse myself, Monsieur Morel, for after this first visit has been paid, I have another which I am most anxious to pay. True, Dantes, I forgot that there was at the Catalan someone who expects you no less impatiently than your father. The lovely Mercedes. Dantes blushed. Aha! said the shipowner. I am not in the least surprised, for she has been to me three times, inquiring if there were any news of the Pharaon. Pest, Edmund, you have a very handsome mistress. She is not my mistress, replied the young sailor gravely. She is my betrothed. Sometimes one and the same thing, said Morel, with a smile. Not with us, sir, replied Dantes. "'Well, well, my dear Edmund,' continued the owner, 
don't let me detain you. You have managed my affairs so well that I ought to allow you all the time you require for your own. Do you want any money? No, sir. I have all my pay to take. Nearly three months' wages. You are a careful fellow, Edmund. Say, I have a poor father, sir. Yes, yes, I know how good a son you are. Now hasten away to see your father. I have a son, too, and I should be very wroth with those who detained him from me after a three months' voyage. Then I have your leave, sir? Yes, if you have nothing more to say to me. Nothing. Captain Leclerc did not, before he died, give you a letter for me? He was unable to write, sir, but that reminds me that I must ask your leave of absence for some days. To get married? Yes, first, and then go to Paris. Very good. Have what time you require, Dantes. It will take quite six weeks to unload the cargo, and we cannot get you ready for sea until three months after that. Only be back again in three months for the pharaon, added the owner, patting the young sailor on the back. Cannot sail without her captain. Without her captain? cried Dantes, his eyes sparkling with animation. Pray mind what you say, for you are touching on the most secret wishes of my heart. Is it really your intention to make me captain of the pharaon? If I were sole owner, we'd shake hands on it now, my dear Dantes, and call it settled. But I have a partner, and you know the Italian proverb, Chi ha compagno ha padrone. He who has a partner has a master. But the thing is at least half done, as you have one out of two votes. Rely on me to procure you the other. I will do my best. Ah, Monsieur Morel, exclaimed the young seaman, with tears in his eyes and grasping the owner's hand. Monsieur Morel, I thank you in the name of my father and of Mercedes. That's all right, Edmund. There's a providence that watches over the deserving. Go to your father. Go and see Mercedes, and afterwards come to me. Shall I row you ashore? No, thank you. I shall remain and look over the accounts with Danglars. Have you been satisfied with him this voyage? That is, according to the sense you attached to the question, sir. Do you mean, is he a good comrade? No, for I think he never liked me since the day when I was silly enough, after a little quarrel we had, to propose to him to stop for ten minutes at the island of Monte Cristo to settle the dispute, a proposition which I was wrong to suggest, and he quite right to refuse. If you mean as responsible agent when you ask me the question, I believe there is nothing to say against him and that you will be content with the way in which he has performed his duty. But tell me, Dantes, if you had command of the pharaon, should you be glad to see Danglars remain? Captain or mate, Monsieur Morel, I shall always have the greatest respect for those who possess the owner's confidence. That's right, that's right, Dantes, I see you are a thoroughly good fellow, and will detain you no longer. Go, for I see how impatient you are. Then I have leave? Go, I tell you. May I have the use of your skiff? Certainly. Then for the present, Monsieur Morel, farewell, and a thousand thanks. I hope soon to see you again, my dear Edmund. Good luck to you. The young sailor jumped into the skiff and sat down in the stern sheets with the order that he be put ashore at La Canbière. The two oarsmen bent to their work, and the little boat glided away as rapidly as possible in the midst of the thousand vessels which choke up the narrow way which leads between the two rows of ships from the mouth of the harbour to the Quai d'Orléans. The shipowner, smiling, followed him with his eyes until he saw him spring out on the quay, and disappeared in the midst of the throng, which from five o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night swarms in the famous street of La Canbière, a street of which the modern Phocéans are so proud that they say with all the gravity in the world, and with that accent which gives so much character to what is said, if Paris had La Canbière, Paris would be a second Marseille. On turning round, the owner saw Danglars behind him, apparently awaiting orders, but in reality also watching the young sailor. But there was a great difference in the expression of the two men who thus followed the movements of Edmond Dantes. End of chapter 1